law. Uh, I'll be talking about um, animal in medicine. Uh, my name is Adam Michael. Uh, I'm a member of the NMR Research Group at the Department of Physics, Federal University of Technology, Minai, Niger State, Nigeria. Um, so, uh, uh, NMR in medicine, uh, I, I, I'll go to straight to definitions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very sure that the time we have is not enough for us to go through uh, all the necessary topics, but we'll try as much as possible uh, to touch the important areas. Uh, a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, is a phenomenon in which uh, a nuclear in a strong magnetic field are perturbed by a weak uh, uh, field and they respond by producing electromagnetic signal. Uh, these electromagnetic signals, uh, they are more or less like something like uh, what we can call a probe. A uh, probe in the sense that uh, they, they respond to energy they absorb energy, they give up energy, and the energies that they give up uh, carries a lot of information about their environment. So that's the reason why we are able to use them uh, to image tissues, materials, and so, uh, so many other things. So they, they tend to absorb this energy in such a way that the signature of this energy can give uh, a lot of information about the environment in which these nuclei are found. Yes, and we can say that NMR is routinely used uh, as in general imaging as uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which we are all familiar with. Uh, I, I like to point out, uh, say at this point that MRI uh, is a technique uh, that, that is based on the principles of nuclear magnetic resonance. So good. Now, uh, majority of uh, uh, human body is made up of um, water. For example, like we have uh, average of 60% water within our body. So uh, as you can see on this slide, we can find them within the intracellular spaces and extracellular places where we, we have water. Then uh, we can get up to like 75% um, uh, water uh, within the body of infants. So uh, what is it a, a relationship between these percentages and NMR? We'll find out uh, in the next slide. So uh, we see that water is made up of uh, hydrogen atom, which we normally know as proton. So uh, these protons, uh, if we have 60% water within our body, then we are sure that almost 60% of our body is made up of these protons as well. So if they permit the, the majority of our body, how can they be used to image what happens within the body? So uh, if we note that these protons, uh, they are positively charged um, particles. So now, uh, yes, sorry. So now uh, I'm very sure most of us remember uh, what we call the uh, the right hand, the, the right hand and the left hand rule, which we are all used to in our elementary physics. Uh, when a charged particle moves, it generates magnetic field and generates some level of current. So the magnetic field that is generated by this particle, uh, we know them as what we call like uh, spin uh, magnetic moment. So uh, normally we shorten it to spin. So uh, because of that, once a charged particle moves, it generates magnetic field. And because of that, they will not see that the proton that we saw earlier in our slide uh, in the water, when they move, they generate magnetic field. And once they generate magnetic field, they form what we call like a nuclear magnet. Uh, nuclear magnet in the sense that we know what we call, uh, magnet is all about. So uh, when we now have a microscopic magnet within our body, so it means that if our body is made up of 60% water, 60% uh, of our body is made up of a lot of small, small, small microscopic magnets, all right? So these microscopic magnets are the basis of nuclear magnetic resonance, okay? All right, so this is the nuclear magnet that we're talking about. So we see that why they are in the body, uh, in the absence of any external magnetic field, that they are oriented in different directions, and uh, we can see on um, uh, the figure, that figure here, here. So we see that they are oriented in different directions. So uh, within our body. 
So once you are placed in an MRI scanner, uh, the external magnetic field, which is venous, align this microscopic magnet in, in a particular direction. So now from our elementary physics, we can say that at this point, that the spin within our body, they are at ground state, you understand? So at ground state, we, they have been aligned in, uh, in the direction of the external magnetic field. So, and they are in ground state. So now when we now apply another magnetic field, which we normally know as B1 field or excitation field, uh, or some, so, sometimes we can call it like RF field. So when we apply it in a perpendicular direction to our B0 field, then uh, we can make this spin to go to an excited uh, state. So uh, the point at which they go to excited state is what um, uh, our uh, speaker mentioned earlier as a uh, Lamo condition. So when Lamo condition is reached, then they absorb enough energy to spin, I mean, to, to be tipped to the perpendicular plane. So once they are tipped to the perpendicular plane, uh, it's not as if they are tipped like um, a normal tipping, perpendicular, um, parallel. But what they do is that while they are getting tipped to that, to that perpendicular plane, uh, they sort of behave like a, a gyroscope. You understand? Like you can see in figure B here, uh, they, you, you see that the spin is vibrating about the B node field. So, and it does that until spin, I mean, it tipped to uh, the perpendicular direction. So once it does that, it does that at Lamo condition. So which means that it has absorbed energy uh, strong enough to cause it to go to the perpendicular direction. So at that point, we can say that it has what? It has um, uh, gone to the excited state, okay? All right, so now after we remove our B1 field, uh, B1 field our spin population goes back to the direction of our external magnetic field, B0. So once they do that, uh, they tend to uh, emit the, uh, the energy that they have absorbed in going to the excited state. So they emit the same energy in order to go back to the ground state. So most times, like some of us who are, who are familiar with uh, NMR, uh, uh, at this point, we, we always say that relaxation has occurred. So when relaxation occurs, they go back to the ground state. In the process, they emit energy. So the energy they emit, uh, like a radio frequency uh, energy that they emit is in form of electromagnetic uh, radiation. So once it's emitted, this energy carries a lot of information about what has happened to the spin, where they are, what has happened. And uh, for your information, I know some of us are familiar uh, with what we call T1 and T2 relaxation times. Okay, so uh, for T T1 relaxation and T2 relaxation times, they are unique uh, time measurement that it takes for this spin to go back to the original state from excited state. So the Fortunately for us, the T1 magnetic field, I mean, T1 relaxation times, they are unique for every uh, nuclei or every, part, every particle, every substance. So there's no single substance, I mean, a uh, different substance that relax at the same T1 uh, relaxation time. So, and T2 relaxation times has to do with what we call uh, uh, molecular interaction. So we can have, for example, uh, like, um, let's say uh, we are trying to do NMR of water, all right? So we see that uh, water is similar to CSF, okay? That's the cerebral, uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So they are close to water. So because of the uh, uh, a little difference between these substances, they have unique T1 values, okay? All right, so now when you now take CSS as an example, we notice that the T2 value uh, can be different depending on the location or let me say the tissue in which the CSF is found. So which means that we can do uh, uh, interpart, inter substance and intrasubstance um, uh, contrast with T1 and T2 relaxation times, okay? So uh, now we notice that uh, in the presence of this external magnetic field, then the 
energy that I just mentioned uh, is, is represented in form of what we call magnetization field. So the magnetization is represented as uh, M in this figure. And we see that we can see that the magnetization has different values along the planes. You can have like uh, along X plane, which is normally known as a longitudinal magnetization. And the ones along the X and Y plane are known as a transverse uh, magnetization field. So uh, now the, then we can see that um, uh, I, I don't want it to go into complicated issues because like when we get to this point, we know we, we have what we call laboratory frame of reference and the uh, rotating frame of reference that will allow us to uh, simplify the problem that is presented before us. But as you can see uh, in this uh, figure, uh, this is exactly what happens uh, uh, at molecular level. Then you see the magnetization that is rotating, uh, what we normally say precision, uh, about the external magnetic field, okay? All right, so now, uh, like you said, the effect of the RF radiation on the net magnetization is to produce a second magnetic field, which is our MY. So MY uh, is essentially a measure of the energy that is being given up by the spin that we have just excited. So now, what we now do is that after we have applied uh, 90 degree RF force, uh, the Magnetization lies along the XY plane and rotates about the Z axis. So, uh, we, like we mentioned, uh, the component of it now decays or relax at unique relaxation times. So, the uh, this uh, precision, uh, precision uh, of the transverse uh, uh, magnetization now induces uh, RF energy within uh, an external coil, which we have here as a receiver coil. So the receiver coil is what takes our signal value in terms of amplitude. And as you can see, this signal amplitude is uh, a function of time, okay? So in order for us to reconstruct the image that we normally see in the cleaning, we have to do what we call Fourier transformation. So what we just need to do is that we uh, perform Fourier transformation on the signal amplitude and we'll be able to get like we can see here, like uh, uh, the FID is what we call a uh, Fourier induction decay. So uh, a relaxing uh, uh, energy. So the two uh, FIDs here, yeah, uh, we can have different types, like uh, like you can see sinusoidal one, like uh, the two are different. So when we perform Fourier transformation, uh, we, we, we will not uh, transform from time domain into frequency domain. So in frequency domain, that is where we'll now be able to see all that the necessary information we have been looking for. For example, this particular example is more or less what we call magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we see that like uh, the, the information in the, in the upper figure uh, is not as clear as those on the lower one. So we have peaks here, which we can actually associate with different substances. So these are the things uh, that allow us to identify one particular molecular material from the other. So because of these differences in molecular material, that's the reason why we are able to use NMR to image the human tissue. So uh, because the materials are different from each other, the way they relax is different. And sometimes we can actually have like um, some other additional contrast, um, uh, sources of contrast for our imaging, all right? So now, when we look at the precision here, uh, the basis of this precision uh, have been explained. But what we need to know from physics perspective is that this precision is guided by what we call an equation of motion. And luckily for us, this uh, equation of motion is what we call uh, block equations, uh, which describe the net magnetization uh, um, with, uh, I mean, that's the, uh, as they change with time. Yes, it was developed in 1946 uh, by uh, Felix Bloch. So, and we can see that um, the upper equations uh, were resolved to have different individual components, which is given uh, the lower equation. Now, uh, uh, I'm happy to tell you that most of the MR scanners that we are using 
they are based on this equation. So there's no way we can actually separate the theory from the experiment. So uh, these are the theories on which some of these equipment are based. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure and I can tell you that uh, it's not all MRI scanners that are based on these equations. You understand? Uh, we have many ones like uh, someone mentioned uh, uh, EPR yesterday, that's uh, electron paramagnetic resonance. So uh, the equations are a bit different from this. So, but the, basically in MNMR, uh, about 60% of our uh, scanners are based on the principle of this equation. Now, what, uh, uh, what are the applications that we can use this for in medicine? Like, uh, like I mentioned to us, we have unique uh, realization times. Uh, clinical application of photon imaging uh, can be used in the brain for, um, yes, for distinguishing gray matter and white matter. Uh, we know that mostly uh, this is very important when it comes to uh, ne uh, neurological problems within uh, the brain where you need to like Alzheimer's disease, uh, Hutchinson's disease, and so many other brain related diseases. So it is very important for us to be able to image uh, the brain such that we'll be able to see uh, the areas uh, uh, where the damage is coming from. Is it the gray matter or the white matter? Then we have those of imaging posterior foci, the brainstem, uh, spinal cord. Uh, this has application, especially uh, when you call about um, uh, uh, cancer, you understand, like uh, two different tumors and early detection. Uh, number three is the, to detect the, uh, the malignant lessons, tumors uh, and infections. So uh, one of the uh, application of NMR is that it allows us to detect some of these uh, 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 conditions as early as possible. Then we can move to abdomen, like it has been find, it has found application in the metabolic liver disease, uh, measurement of uh, liver and IO overload uh, in um, in a, a hemochromatosis. The focal areas of inflammation in chronic active hepatitis. So uh, these are areas in which NMR have found application uh, in uh, abdo, uh, in clinical abdominal imaging. So uh, in, in the kidney, we can uh, NMR have been used to distinguish renal cortex from the medulla. And uh, for example, like uh, patients who have suffered uh, from uh, diabetes and other related conditions. So it's very important for us to be able to evaluate a uh, transplanted kidney uh, in order for us to treat uh, the patient. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point to is that NMR is not only uh, important uh, in clinical diagnosis. Uh, it is very, very important in monitoring the patient. Uh, you need to monitor the, after the patient after treatment. So when we, uh, when we go into the pelvis, we see that NMR imaging uh, be able to differentiate between benign prostatic uh, hyperplasia and, and prostat uh, prostatic carcinoma. So uh, these are tumor-based conditions. So we may be able to differentiate between uh, uh, meta, um, tissues that are, meta, uh, that are undergoing metastasis and those that do not. So then it has been able to detect bladder tumors. Yeah. So uh, in the heart, we be able to use it for tumor, uh, to build the images of the heart muscle, uh, uh, the chambers and other structures. Uh, there's a particular application that we are used to, which we call magnetic resonance and geography. So this is the rely on the principles of NMR uh, for building, I mean, for developing images of blood uh, vessels. So um, most of us, we are aware that uh, this uh, uh, has helped in detecting uh, uh, ruptures uh, in blood vessels, blockage in blood vessels. For example, like uh, most of us, we have had of patients who are so who have suffered from stroke uh, what really happened is that uh, one of the blood vessels have been blocked so in order for us to be able to detect this uh, this condition before the onset uh, of the stroke we, may, we, may, we should be able to see uh, the build up 
uh, of fatty materials along these blood vessels because they are mostly responsible for this blockage. Now, uh, in breast MRI, uh, we uh, use it for uh, early detection of uh, breast abnormalities so that we'll be able to tell uh, which one is metastatic or not. So that, uh, for example, like in Africa, we see that uh, most of the death we have among our women has to do with uh, uh, breast cancer. And the real problem we always have is early detection. It's always difficult. Uh, most patients don't go to the hospital until the condition becomes too late. And once, it, when we you even go to the hospital, the cost of performing an MRI is always very exorbitant, especially in developing countries. So most patients are not, uh, they try as much as possible to put it off until it becomes too late. So uh, we are hoping that in the next few years, we'll be able to develop a uh, cheaper methods uh, that can encourage patients to go for routine tests so that they can get scanned as soon as possible and detect whether these conditions are there or not. So uh, we, NMR2 has found application uh, in Moscow localizer system uh, in which uh, um, image of muscles, tendons, and ligaments are built. I mentioned to us before uh, how it finds application in blood vessels and flow, like atherosclerotic vascular diseases, and then we'll be able to assess blood flow in major blood vessels. Uh, all right. So now uh, we use it also, like I mentioned, in MRS, that's uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, or what you call in vivo spectroscopy. Uh, all right, MRS in, in vitro, uh, that's outside the body. So, but we can actually perform in vivo spectroscopy uh, by using chemical shift techniques that will allow us to measure uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different markers uh, in uh, uh, what I call different diseases because we see that a lot of uh, molecular substances are responsible or they show up during these diseases. So, once we are able to detect them, uh, we can be able to infer that this uh, condition is present because this molecule has been found in the process of uh, in vivo spectroscopy, okay? All right, so now why NMR imaging? Why do we use NMR imaging? Uh, one of the reasons why we use NMR imaging because it, it, it eliminates the risk of X radiation. Uh, like we mentioned in the case of uh, uh, X3 and some other techniques, yeah, you understand, like uh, we know that the energy in these techniques have to be applied in a very unique uh, way so that uh, the amount that will be delivered into the patient body will not be too much so that it does not cause risk. So the, the, this risk is actually not associated with NMR. So uh, we, we don't have to be afraid of um, ionizing radiation. Then one other uh, advantage is that it has excellent spatial and contrast resolution. So some other, uh, some tissues that cannot be easily seen by other techniques can easily be seen on uh, NMR imaging. So uh, NMR imaging actually allows for detection of diseases at early stages. All right, so now uh, I'm, I'm going to describe how this number three have been very important. Today there's a problem with tissues. The signs are already on T1 and T2 relaxation times. So if we are able to measure, we actually can find out the disease has started at molecular level before it actually reflects. Even sometimes, uh, some, some state, uh, we have situations where you'll be told that you have to wait after three weeks, like one month for them to be able to, uh, to be sure that you have certain diseases. T1 and T2 realization times can actually afford us the opportunity to see this as soon as possible, okay? All right, so now, what are the challenges? Uh, when it comes to NMR, you know, suffering from uh, low budgets and poor funding. You understand? Like, this is uh, issues that we are all aware of. Uh, we do not have enough money to procure some of these um, important scanners. For instance, like um, as at five years ago, uh, there were one or two 1.5 Tesla in the, in the whole of Nigeria. 
So and uh, in the in an entire uh, continent of Africa, I don't think we we have up to twenty. So, but recently a, a lot of things have improved. Uh, this is due to low budget. Then secondly, uh, for those who are equipment, equipment, uh, we have inadequate power supply as we have not. We have problem with equipment maintenance. So uh, now uh, there'll be attempt to overcome these challenges. Uh, I, I like to share uh, Federal University of Technology MINA experience, like uh, in, in a ways of getting, because we have these challenges, we feel that this should not stop us from doing NMR. So even if we do not have the equipment, if we don't have the opportunity for now, there are ways, uh, it, it has developed several methods in which we can be developing NM, NMR, MRI models for the past 20 years. I actually joined this group about 13 years ago. So, and we have been making a lot of improvement over the years, okay? So now I, I, I'd like to show some of the applications that uh, we will be able to uh, develop using computational methods. So uh, selected applications. So uh, this is uh, application of computational models to clean simulation of magnetic resonance. We actually uh, using the block equation I just showed to us. Uh, we introduced the flow mechanism into it uh, in order for us to be able to monitor the flow flow and quantify them according to the tissues that is being considered. Then we use it to simulate the response of contrast agents. We know, we know that contrast agents are not, uh, they are not supposed to stay in the body for too long. So what we do is that we need to run a lot of simulation. So this simulation helps us to do as much as possible before we inject them into the body so that we can maintain the safety of the patient, all right? So another application is uh, uh, we develop uh, a model for for hemorrheology, yes, uh, that's um, uh, the stud study of the flow properties of the blood and the components such as plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelet. And luckily for us, uh, plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelet, they have unique T1 and T2 realization times. So they are never the same. Because of that, this allows us to be able to simulate their response according to their unique features. So, and this uh, the results we got from that model, all right? So now, uh, in recent time, we have been able to introduce what we call a dual mix uh, into our line of research. Uh, like we know, radio mix is all about uh, the images we see. They are, they are not just images. They are data. They are data points. They are data sets, all right? So now what we have been doing in recent time is... Uh, using the method of radiomics to extract numerical information for our images. So when we absorb, I mean, extract these values, we can use it to do what you call a better reconstruction. Uh, I wish I'll be, I have the time to show us the original MRI images for uh, uh, to that, the original scan that were taken from necrosis and tumor progression, all right? But these are the results we were able to get. We actually extracted numerical value from this, this, the MRI scan. So, and we use that numerical value. Uh, we, we develop a computer program that reconstruct this MRI image from the numerical value. So now for some of us who are being in physics, we can, we can actually use those numerical values to make as many calculations as possible. Uh, we can make improvement to temporal resolution. We can make improvement to spatial resolution. We can, we can try and use it for machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, data training, and so on and so forth. So what we are saying is that our scan, MRI scan, needs, uh, like we had a, an experience recently, we were in an hospital last uh, two years ago, uh, where we were told that most of the scans that have been uh, obtained for the patient, that there are no ways, they were not able to store this data. So if we have ways of having like a server, in, especially in this, we have a server where 
we have to build like um, telemedicine system that can be used for early diagnosis. So all we just need to do is to develop our uh, computer model, use machine learning, and see how we can detect without them having to go to uh, repeated MRI scanning. So which means that it will give enough time for the radiologist to scan more patients. So if you scan once or scan twice, then we can use machine learning to assist the radiologist in performing further diagnosis. So they don't have to come over and over again. So more patients can actually be accommodated within those period of time. Yes. Then uh, we, there's a particular uh, problem that I've been noticed um, some years back uh, that uh, at 1.5 Tesla, and probably like 0 0.5 Tesla, it's difficult to detect Parkinson's disease. Uh, the scan, we are not able to detect them. So now, but we built a model in which we use the block equation uh, to detect uh, uh, what we call to detect um, Parkinson's disease uh, from control patients. So what they did, uh, what we used is that we did, uh, we made use of relaxation time measurement. So uh, now we we have um, an equipment MRI equipment that we call a relaxometer, which are which is actually cheaper, like ten times cheaper than a typical MRI scanner. So this this equipment are, are basically for measuring T1 and T2 values. So they are not for uh, a typical um, uh, MR imaging. So the measure T1 and T2 relaxation time. So we can actually use some of this equipment, especially in developing countries. If we don't have the fund from a big broker scanner, so we can actually get a relaxometer, uh, as, uh, which is produced, can actually be used to detect this disease as early as possible. So we can actually do, it could be a low budget, uh, a low budget diagnosis. But the point is this, uh, it's better we have a method than not having any at all. So if we have a method, no matter how low they are, no matter how uh, uh, low contrast they are, it's still better than not having anything. So we feel that for the developing researchers in developing countries, we can actually start somewhere. Uh, we know we, we may not be able to get to the expected point in a few years' time, but we can start somewhere and use what we have to do our diagnosis and do our patient monitoring. Diagnosis and therapy coming together as one modality, okay? So uh, we were able to find out that we can actually use uh, our RF excitation field to eat up some tissues, selectively eat up some tissues. Uh, for example, in the treatment of cancer, we can apply the same RF field uh, that will not eat uh, uh, gray matter areas or, or white matter areas, but we, we only elevate the temperature of the region with tumor. So we are able to find ways of using the same excitation field to diagnose uh, uh, tumors and to apply, uh, to conduct what we call control hypothermia. So we can raise the temperature there to heat up the tissues until we can uh, initiate uh, um, uh, tissue destruction, uh, so to say. All right, so now the same method where uh, I've been used for uh, other diseases. All right, so we have current research effort. So we, we are currently uh, in the process of de um, completing development of MRI artificial intelligence algorithm for computer aided diagnosis of brain tumor. So we are able to get uh, brain images that we are able to build a classification model. Uh, for AI uh, brain, I mean, brain tumor diagnosis. So uh, these are not actually meant to replace a radiologist. So, but the thing is that we, we, we are finding ways of providing help to clinical scientists, like how much help can we provide to them? How much can the computer actually learn from their knowledge that can be used uh, to ease the number of time they, they spend in the laboratories and the number of time they, uh, they spend in performing uh, 
uh, image processing. So secondly, we are currently working on redomins in NMR and MRI, like I described before. We are trying to see different ways of extracting numerical information from every image that we have. Then this numerical information can actually be used for so many things. You can use it to be computational model, run simulations, and provide data set that we can use for machine learning. Then we are actually look, uh, currently looking at super resolution with machine learning. So what I mean by this is that we, we notice that most of our scanners are still low uh, at low field. Uh, some of them are still uh, slow at 0 0.2 Tesla. Then we have 0 0.5 Tesla, 0 0.7 Tesla, which are still low compared to 1.5 Tesla. So now uh, we are looking for ways in which we can use machine learning to improve the contrast of our low resolution image, you understand? Like, it, it, it's still, like I mentioned before, it's still not a replacement uh, for like a, a scan from a three Tesla machine. So, but the point is this, as long as we don't have the means here, we can actually use the current uh, opportunity provided by machine learning and computational method, because you see that our com computational capacity have been increasing significantly over the years, we can actually adopt this, especially in developing, uh, developing countries and see how some of these new methods can be used to help in solving the challenges we are facing.